Welcome everyone, good afternoon uh, to this session on modern love. It's the last session on the second and last day of this Vidar Blessing Festival. So good to see you here in such large numbers to listen to three ladies uh, talking about a uh, highly debatable topic I think on modern love. I see so many youngsters here, I'm so happy to see all of you and they're the ones who are really needing to uh, get uh, a lot of clarity on this word love. Now earlier I was um, I was just moderating um, Madhuri's book on uh, infinite variety of desire in India, history of desire in India. And the word itself, the word love, she says is uh, for her a very vanilla term. And having uh, already told you what her take on the word love is, I'm going to straight away jump into the topic for today, modern love. And uh, I'm going to ask these three lovely ladies here what their idea of the term modern love uh, is all about. What is their idea? So can we start with Natasha, please? Natasha Padmar. Uh, first, a big round of applause for our panelists here. Um, Arushi has introduced uh, them while they were still uh, yeah, a little incognito. We were there hiding away in the corner. So now that they are here up on stage, Natasha, Madhavi, and me. Yeah, Natasha. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I suppose when we say modern love, then it, we, we compare it to something and perhaps that's traditional love yeah. or uh, classic love. Uh, I, if I had to interpret modern love and in my writing I'm constantly doing that, uh, I would say that uh, uh, modern love better be far more robust and secure, uh, be willing to be questioned, examined, uh, deconstructed, uh, be uh, uh, you know willing to be taken apart, to be rejected, to be told to stand in the corner uh, because its time is not right, uh, to be told uh, that it doesn't work, and 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 then go and mend itself, and so that it's useful to. Uh, to the people uh, whose love it is, uh, and and that's what I uh, am constantly exploring in my writing: the love between uh, parents and children. Uh, it better be a modern love if we want, if we truly want to raise a generation that is not bogged down by the same old scripts, where the elders are always right, and jab tumhara vakt aayega then you can have fun, which uh, everybody knows, but particularly the elders ki wo vakt to kabhi aata hai nahi. The love between, um, um, you know, uh, a husband and a wife, the love between lovers, between friends, between uh, uh, new relationships uh, that you form as you uh, uh, carry on in your life. So one of the relationships I've written about a lot is the one between my mother-in-law and me. Uh, I, I call her Ammi and uh, uh, she reminds me very much of my grandmother because uh, my grandmother was, uh, I lost my nani when I was nine and then in my thirties when I met my mother-in-law she was the same age as my nani and I kind of felt like perhaps she'd come back into my life. And it felt like a really odd thing because you're supposed to be scared of your mother-in-law and you're supposed to have a very formal relationship with her and she's, uh, uh, she can be very intimidating. Uh, and you're, you're, if, if your own mother finds you cozying up to your, uh, your mother-in-law, she tell you, uh, you know, to behave in a certain way. And um, uh, modern love insists that uh, it will not be told how to behave in a certain way. It will, uh, it will be completely uh, uh, dictated by the moment and uh, by by the needs of the two people in it. 
Uh, and um, that, that really is uh, what I think we have to all give ourselves the permission to do. Uh, you know, uh, okay, love doesn't, and if they, it doesn't work most of the time, and we should be able to stand up and say that I'm more important than the concept of, uh, of you know, of, of being in love. And, and, and when you give yourself that freedom, you can make love work for you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Um, Ruth has al already outed me in, in a way by, by telling you what I was talking about in my previous session. I'm sorry. No, 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 that's okay. There were many, many people who weren't there, so so this will be news to them. I'm, uh, I mean, I, I want to sort of repeat what I said there, but maybe expand upon it a little bit. Um, and also say, and also make very clear that unlike uh, Natasha who was speaking about uh, different loving relationships or different relationships of love, um, I'm speaking about uh, relationships of desire, so between lovers uh, only, and I'm not talking about other kinds of love. Uh, although what I have to say does extend to other kinds of love, and I am, um, uh, for me, and this is a sort of very, um, uh, for me this is not a new argument, but it strikes people as being utterly radical and revolutionary, even though it isn't, uh, which is that love is a, um, an invention of capitalism. So there's no such thing as old love or traditional love. Love is capitalistic, which is to say it's only about 250 years old. Uh, before that, no one said, you know, I am in love with you or whatever. Love was just this sort of abstraction that no one really uh, spent much time on except in poetry. Um, and so love as we understand it today is a commodity that you're meant to buy into. And if you don't buy into that commodity and if you don't um, wear that commodity, uh, people think there's something wrong with you. Uh, that love becomes this thing that is supposed to fulfill you, that's supposed to, you know, all these expectations that people have of love. Um, it's very much, it's, it's one flavor among many in the marketplace of what you're supposed to buy to make yourself be human or to make yourself be the right kind of human being. And so this is not to deny that people don't have strong feelings for one another. Uh, but for me, love is always something that needs to be greeted with skepticism rather than complete, complete belief. In fact, what's scary about love is that everyone seems to agree that it's wonderful. And, and I always would suggest that if everyone agrees, there's something wrong. And we need to, and we need to think about that. the word modern. Um, <laughs> we all have problems, no? Uh, we'll have to create problems as well. Um, so with literature, you were supposed to be like post-postmodern. I mean, even postmodern was one generation ago. Now we are in some strange post-post-postmodern time. So if one looks at things literally, the literal meaning of words, the word modern would imply something new, but also something that wasn't there before, right? As compared to it, and and in conjunction with love, I don't think there is anything uh, emotionally uh, that is true today and that wasn't true before. I prefer the word contemporary. Contemporary is something I can understand and live with. That okay, contemporary love. What what is that like? Um, I, I also make a distinction now, when I was younger I didn't, but now I make a distinction uh, between love and relationships. Um, a relationship is, is, is something tangible, almost material, almost it's... Um, a relationship is like the flower and love is like the khushbu in the flower, right? It's like the perfume. And, and it is so delicate and so fragile and we try and distill it and bottle it up but it comes and goes when it comes and goes, right? Now the problem with contemporary love that I see it, as I see it, and contemporary relationships 
is that we are actually deeply, deeply, deeply conservative. At no point in our history have we been as conservative in our relationships as we are now. We are completely expected to be monogamous, completely, all our lives, and at no point in history, in Indian history at least, has this been true. By and large, we have been, if not polyamorous, then certainly bigamous or, or polyandrous actually. And all of those shades of being and ways of being have been flattened out, partly through law, but also partly through a general sense of morality. Morality has become entwined with the idea of love, as if somehow it's become immoral to love or desire more than one person, which is my problem with modern. <laughs> that's amazing. That's absolutely correct. Uh, and I'm sure all of you agree that this is our problem of, of contemporary, contemporary, contemporaneity and of contemporary times of uh, love. And we had a movie, Love, Sex or Luka, if you remember. And uh, we live in those times of love, sex and Luka too. Um, we still do. So how does this overexposure to the media um, in terms of body and our obsession with our bodies, of our image, our physical desires, how does that affect love? There is still such a huge blank area as to being comfortable in our own skin. We are very com uncomfortable with our desires. So, um, Natasha, my question to you, which is the right age to familiarize our children with their own bodies, their desires and their selves? The idea that we familiarize children with their, with their own desires is in itself a flawed idea. You know, the, the idea that the parent or the adult owns uh, this uh, moment in which the child steps, uh, you know, that there is a moment when you tell them about the birds and bees or there is a moment when you tell them that their uh, body has other functions. Uh, we know that from our personal experiences from uh, everybody's individual life story, that, that that's not how it happens. We're constantly uh, in our uh, language asking this question of each other and trying to, uh, you know, find a modern way of doing things, a, a more, a newer way of doing things than what was done earlier, than what happened earlier and, you know, one of the excuses uh, or one of the arguments that we make is that uh, because of exposure to media, because of uh, excessive uh, possibilities of sexual violence, we need to tell children uh, about something uh, that will in some way protect them uh, or, or, or be like uh, a, a shield between them and what, and what is going wrong in the, in the world outside. So. Uh, in a, in a sense, what um, we, we might all be saying the same thing on this panel, but the, the lens through which I'm looking at, um, at the same issues is the individual journey. You know, that it, it will be an, um, you know, I have three children and for each one of them, the journey will not be the same. One of them may all by herself come and tell me that she knows something about herself that she wants to share, she's not sure whether it's good or bad, or she knows it's good but she's not sure whether she can tell it, and you know, she'll tell me. Another one will tell me, don't try this conversation with me, I don't want to have it. So she's in a, you know, at the same age, she's in a completely different place. and. Um, and if we, we, we just have to go back into our own growing up years to remember uh, that it was not necessarily a conversation with a parent or a teacher that was a turning point or that there was not necessarily even a turning point. It, it, everything is quite created. Um, but there was another uh, aspect to your question. Uh, Yeah. Back area as to how we are not comfortable with our own bodies. 
and the image that we need to have about our own body. Because uh, if we, uh, I believe, if we don't love ourselves, we cannot love anybody else. And loving ourselves means loving our physicality as well as our yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, you know, there are uh, no. So, does a parent need any role in this? As you, as you already answered. So, one, how does one come to love oneself? How does one come to know oneself through one's body, through one's desires? Yeah. How, so, you, I think, answer that you don't. Yeah. Then I just move over to the mother to talk about um, uh, if we find it so. I mean, we, you just mentioned poetry as well. So, how does I mean, so much love is communicated through words, through poetry, through the poetry of uh, signs as well as symbols? And uh, the more we write about poetry, the more difficult it gets. So, why is love so complicated? Because it's not real. <laughs> <laughs> This is what we need to understand. The reason love poetry is so gorgeous and beautiful and wonderful, why uh, literature about love is so wonderful, is because they're not writing about something real. And if you just, if you remember, and you know, Ruta, you are a professor of literature as well, so you'll know exactly what I'm speaking about. There is not a single love story in the history of literature that ends happily. <laughs> Not one. Precisely because love, as you're thinking about that, and and they both die in the end. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then then, happen, right? then there's, there's no more possibility of grief. <laughs> and you know when their parents grieve, things like that. <laughs> um, and it becomes immortalized as the love story, right? Romeo and Juliet is the classic example. Or Leila and Marcia, or Eve Raja, all of them. Everyone dies. But that's because that is, is a specific sort of kind of abstract, idealized love. What we're talking about in the material world, which is much messier, which is much more fraught with danger, not fraught with danger, but fraught with everyday reality. That kind of love, do you really want to read literature about that? Right? Do you really want to read poetry about that? It isn't. It's, it's sort of much more, which is why I'm talking about that kind of love. Um, is actually not not what we think about when we think about love. The sort of daily haggling and negotiations and give and take and sort of tears and laughter and pain and all that stuff, all of which is under love. But you're not going to find a Hallmark greeting card saying, celebrate pain. <laughs> Even though pain is very much a part of love. You're not, you're not going to find... You are not going to find a February 14th in, in uh, dedicated to tears. <laughs> Even though tears are very much a part of love. So, so this is what I said, my critique of love is that we tend to be uh, mono, monosyllabic about it, monolinguistic uh, about it, monochromatic about it, which is like that it means one thing alone, which it doesn't. It's a messy, messy affair. And we um, insist on monogamy. Exactly, exactly. And because it's so complicated, um, Relationships are, and we know every day, extremely complicated. So then I'm going to open this up to you now. I mean, we, uh, we, we're going to give you a chance to express your views and ask the panelists questions. Are we afraid to express our love to people around us? Can we get that question to you? I'm asking you. Are we ex afraid to express our love to people around us? Family, friends, that secret crush, that uh, you know, unrequited love, that secret desire. Are we afraid? Yes. Yes, yes of yes. course we are afraid. So let's let's have a conversation going there. Can somebody pass around the mic in the audience? Yes, one lady. We are afraid of being rejected. I think we need the mic. We are afraid. We are very afraid because we are afraid of being rejected. And rejection is very much part of love. We get rejected every day in love. In small things. And uh, my only point is that uh, let us not be afraid of rejection, small or big. Which, which Urdu poetry, uh, which I'm a, uh, I translate Urdu poetry and write, uh, Urdu poetry celebrates rejection and failure. I mean, and that's failure, so that's yes. So because we live in an ecosystem which is all about success, right? You have to succeed in everything and if you're a failure, that means, you know, you're a loser, no one, it's not important. 
In love, failure is an integral part of it. It is an absolute necessity. Um, not only in, in the Urdu poetry that you're talking yeah, about, but that, absolutely. That, that brings me to a point of modern love, for which we have to tell the generations to come to yeah. move away from. That is what yeah. my point is. Right? Thank you so much. The first thing that we think of is relationship, as Lam said, the uh, boundary gets blurred very soon. And even in relationships, relationships are not just between a man and a woman or a girl or a girl or a boy or a boy or even romantic. It can be between a mother and a child or two children who are playing together. Love comes in all shapes and sizes. So my problem with that concept is that it's again very monochromatic in that sense but also that we seem to be incapable of think about love when it's outside of a romantic or a sexual relationship. So in somewhere from us being Neanderthals and clubbing each other on the head in the name of love to modern relationships where we are exploring all the spectrums. Somewhere we have gotten deviated from what it actually means. And the main problem with that is nobody knows what it actually means. Exactly. So. That's why it's so complicated. Yeah. I, I mean when we feel it. I disagree with Malti that it isn't real. I think it is real. It's just that it's intangible and it's amorphous and it's ephemeral. It's not a constant, hard, solid thing that you get touched or locked down or bolted into place or um, or assume that it will, that just because you feel it today that you will also feel it tomorrow. It's a feeling, right? It's like anger. It's just because you're angry today doesn't mean you're going to be angry three days later. Um, the construction of a relationship involves many things. And it includes a lot of social cohesion where love may or may not be part of that process, you know. And love may grow in some way, in, in some, some form of attachment may develop that you can call love also. But I think anybody who has been in love even for like five minutes knows what it is and that, that it is true. But if it's not um, if it's yeah, not tangible, um, giving the same amount of love for our partner as well. You you are afraid of not getting what you want. Right. Yeah, because you have an idea of something that you want. <laughs> uh, not really a question, but just your opinion. Uh, Ma'am, you said no love stories and literature ended up happening, but Mr. Darcy and Elizabeth did get married. <laughs> 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 So I think in order for it to be, of course it exists, but what that it is, how it's tied to materiality, our conversations we need to have instead of taking it as a transparent word, it's the least transparent word in the world, and yet we pretend that it is so seated. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and when you ask this question, you know, one of the reasons why we are afraid to express our love is, a lot of you know, responsibility comes with it. And we are all afraid to you know, shoulder responsibility. Because you will say, love me, I love my dog also. <laughs> so, so, so the question, question, question that you know, bothers me, can we get caught in again? We didn't get that line, sir. What did you say? I mean, if, if you love me, love my dog, that was all. Hindi के एक बहुत बड़े लेखक हो गए हैं अग्गे नाम के उनका एक बात क्या है जो मुझे मतलब अपने बचपन से बहुत अच्छा लगा क्योंकि मैं अभी भी अपने आप को बुरा नहीं समझता हूँ इसलिए मैं बचपन से कह रहा हूँ वो था कि प्रेम जो है वो स्वेच्छा से स्वीकार्य नहीं गुलामी है so in fact, uh, one question which I wanted to ask Madhuri in the last session, which I couldn't because of the lack of time, I think I'll take this opportunity. By and large, you know, mankind are supposed to be polygamous by nature. But why would that, uh, it is alleged that mankind, I mean, unintended. You, humankind. <laughs> yeah, no, that's what I'm asking. <laughs> Man, man, 
I am one intended I said. Okay. One intended I said. And therefore my question is, how can man alone be polyamorous unless the woman will cooperate? Krishna, I am not a sexologist or an anthropologist, so I don't have uh, figures for anything. Uh, but the fact of the matter, fact that we had laws against having multiple partners suggests that there is something to be legislated against. And the thing to be legislated against is so deep-rooted and so deep-seated that you actually need all the force of the law to come down on your head about it. I mean, it's, it's, very, it's very simple, right? If there was not a threat, there wouldn't be a law to guard against that threat. And polyandry, polygamy uh, have been sort of recorded historically across the world, across the civilizations and cultures, thousands of years. Um, but we are, and you know, this goes back to something I said the last time, something that um, Annie picked up on as well. We are so conservative at this moment in time. We have regressed so much that we think this is the way in which love can and must be expressed. It has to be expressed in monogamy, it has to be expressed in marriage. Um, whereas, of course, as you rightly pointed out, there is no historical precedent for that. It's, it, that's, what I'm, that's also what I meant by saying it's not real. It doesn't actually, it can't actually point to something and say that's where it comes from. Madhavi, um, please, you talked about critique, love, the critique of love, right? Uh, love's labor is not always lost. And, and because you said the word, use the word critique of love, I'll bring Pascal who says that the heart has its reason that no reason can understand. Yeah. So I would like to say a couple of things here. Uh, one is, uh, well, whether the love is real or not, but we can agree on one thing. Like in psychology, we say that intense and irrational fear is phobia, right? So I would like to define love as intense and irrational liking is love. <laughs> Isn't it? Yeah, and then two things I have. Uh, one is generally it goes people assume that love is unconditional. Do you agree? No. I don't think. Because no love can be unconditional as such. So this is a myth which has to be burst that love is unconditional. And then love cannot only be conceptualized in the romantic law as somebody rightly said. It's a, it loves mohabbat ka adna sa prasana hai, simte to dile aashik hai, or phele to zamana hai. So, so, love which is outside this romantic conceptual like mother and son and daughter and siblings and all. See, romantic love has love and sex. They go together. Sex is the objective correlative for love, normally. What about the other uh, wider perspective of love? What objective correlatives do we find there? Okay, the, the problem with this uh, uh, like uh, Madhvi said, pedestalizing love it is the idea that uh, it is unconditional and therefore it is greater than every other uh, emotion or every other feeling or every other thing that human beings do. Uh, you know, love, love, uh, love should be as conditional as anything else is. Um, I don't see why we separate love from every other kind of human experience and emotion. We keep, ex I think more than other people expecting things of us in love or from love, I think it is we who expect things from love. Um, you take this emotion, you give it a name, and then you somehow expect it to solve all your problems and to take away all your grief and to somehow <laughs> make you whole. And perhaps that is what love is. Perhaps that is this feeling and this hope that somehow feeling something for someone will heal something in you and, and take care of all the other negative stuff that life will bring you. Um, but I think it is the condition we impose on love rather than the, the conditionality of love itself. Feeling or a decision that you make to love. Do we decide to love someone? Is that a decision or is it a feeling? Because when you decide to love someone, then you are taking action on it. Even Shakespeare said, it's the marriage of true minds. He doesn't talk the heart. Well, Ghalib has said, you know, 
uh, I'm not sure if Ghalib has said it, but there is an Urdu saying, everything has said to be Ghalib only. That go on here, to lagai na lage, banai na bane, bujai na bane. So it's, it's I, I really don't know if one can engineer love in that thought out way. You can decide to form relationships. I'm not sure you can decide to love. The heart, the arrow inside it, and just remember Kale, ka udusra mai, ye khalish kaha se hoti jo jigar ke paar hota. So, uh, coming back to Dalib on that sense, means the, the arrow inside the heart keeps the heart in pain. But the heart is not in pain, but the heart is in pain. If the heart is in pain, the Right? So, it is the pain factor which needs to be identified and that pain has to be located as Madhavi Madam said, into our world. Because love to qualify must be able to reflect and see whether that pain is happening there or not. Say for example, I love my wife and I say, come on, you are not going to work even if you want. I, I, I love you and then you, therefore you should not uh, wear mini skirts. I love you, therefore you should not go along with your friends. Right? So, recognition of that pain, that collaterality, is I guess is an essential part, that materiality part of what you might feel in whatever way you would like. Your response. All that stuff. I mean, I think you're absolutely right, right? People who, uh, men who throw acid on women's faces claim to love them. Uh, it's, it, I mean, there are all kinds of loves and loves in the world and many of them are deeply, I say all of them are deeply problematic, but some more than others. Right? <laughs> if we stick with the, if we stick with the more attractive notions of love or the more attractive kinds of love, the kinds that we all want to feel and that I hope we will all feel, some way, shape or form, even that, and I want to go back to that sort of materialistic argument, even that is extremely contractual. I will love someone so long as that person makes me feel good about myself. Which is to say my love is actually for me. Not about that other person at all except as a means to that end. Now there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with thinking about love as being utterly narcissistic. But we have to actually, we have to actually recognize it for what it is. And so it's the sort of mystification of love, which as I said, is absolutely brilliant and wonderful in some realms. It's not a material reality at all. And so the Marxist critique, of course, would be that this is not grounded in anything. And once you start grounding love, that's when all these really hideous faces of love come into being. And we can't just ignore them. Although, as I said earlier, you won't find an Archie's greeting card or a Hallmark greeting card that deals with these notions of love. We all know that the heart does not look like that. <laughs> right? But we all assume that that's what represents it. Yeah, so uh, there's always, I mean, there's looking at all the youngsters here. I mean, you all have these questions. I've fallen in love, it hurts. <laughs> I've fallen out of love, it hurts even worse. <laughs> and so, move on to the next. We have so many young uh, advice columns saying, okay, I'm facing this rejection. She said, we fear rejection, uh, we fear falling in love, we fear also talking about what we really, I mean, the, the emotion that is real, not real, we do feel something, that to they definitely is real. So what do we feel for this friend who we have been working, our colleagues, our uh, co-workers, we work on a particular project, we get close in that work, we maybe get intimate and then we move apart and before we get intimate, we are so scared to say that I do love you because that are not that there are also laws against that. You see, this is yeah. the point of the world. There are laws against falling in love with having an affair. I know, so I mean, how can you have I'm such a law? I mean, you, you fall in love and you like that person, you live with, uh, you live with that person. There are, the whole there are laws against falling in love. Yeah. There are laws for acting upon you. Upon that. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. so, my little observation was that when we come close to one another, man, man, woman, woman, man, woman, it's so easy to give a girl a hug. Oh, and then say, I love you, I love the way you've done this for me and I really love you. Try doing that as a woman to another man or maybe 10 years younger to you, 
your co-worker, you take two minutes to think, what is that guy going to think of me if I give him a big hug and say I love you? So, this is the kind of age we are living in where we cannot really talk about who we love, again for fear of some intangible fear. Ruta, luckily women also are not happy with that situation. <laughs> we don't want those creepy men coming up to me. Uh, we are not aware, we as a humans are not aware. Uh, so whatever we feel, be it love, be it anger or be it any emotions, anxiety, depression, anything, it all uh, comes down to a point of release of certain hormones in our body. Be it dopamine, serotonin or any uh, love hormone, there are certain kinds of hormones, right? So people are not aware about it. So we live in an attention economy where uh, you, are, you are spending uh, hours on Instagram creating a fake profile and then falling in love with anything or uh, uh, just uh, take Tinder as an example it's just a flash market you swipe right within a minute you have to decide so but my point is we have all talked about love but uh, we as humans need to be aware like uh, when uh, you are looking at a girl or a, when a girl is looking at a boy where your blood is flowing is it flowing to your sexual organs or is it like no no like going to your heart yes going to your heart or something people need to be aware about this thing because uh, you know uh, growing up we have seen Bollywood Hollywood movies which uh, create a definition of love in our mind we read books about love so we as growing up we don't know what love is and uh, then there are expectations around us like suppose uh, if my heart is broken then I have to react like a certain thing like I need to cry or I need to drink something to get over it yeah. so my, I'm just replying to the question what ma'am said like are we uh, fearing that uh, need to love yeah we have like express, expression of love so my answer is that we need to be aware that what's going on inside our body first, <laughs> then define like what I asked Natasha. Say you are aware now. You have all the information about all the different kinds of hormones that are set off in your head. What are you going to do about it? You have that information. Next time you see somebody you like, are you going to tell yourself that I don't really like this person? It's just the hormones going off in my head. The modern love is just like a vegetable love and because of such reasons, the boy is asking in the morning, uh, will you marry me or will you love me or I love you. At the evening, he threw, uh, he threw acid on her face. So what's the action? Because of that, when a widow remarries, it means, what does it mean? When a widow remarries, it means that she remarries. She remarries. Okay, she remarries in the sense she loved her husband, but after his death she wants wanted to. Who knows marry. whether she loved her husband or not? <laughs> no? I mean, constantly we are trying to uh, make that. Part of this material reality of love is so gendered. When you said he will ask her to marry him, and women have for too long felt utterly disempowered in relation to love. And I'm still absolutely horrified when people, young people, still expect the boy to make the first move in a heterosexual relationship and the boy to express desire. Precisely to go back to your second question, when a widow remarries, people turn up their eyebrows because they say, oh my God, she still has desire. And women's desire has always been written out 
of this idea of love, which is one of my problems with it. And I think we really need to, I think everyone in this room, men or women, we need to reclaim the fact that women too have desires. And we too yeah, yeah. might have complicated relationships to love. And we shouldn't wait for men, as always, to take ownership of it. In, in the contemporary world, we have a means to express it. It has been the same. The, the, the emotion has been the same always. It's just that now we have a means to express it and a greater, uh, greater freedom to talk about it around us than uh, compared to as our parents or their parents had. We have a freedom to say it uh, and that's why people, that's why it's a belief that modern love is uh, what she said, a more vegetable love which you, you are, you feel for a person for some time and then it's over. It's not a thing which has come today. It has always been like that. You know, love is not love that alters when it alteration finds. If you examine that life, it uh, points us to the fact that there were always people who were altering a lot. Their feelings were altering. Um, however, I, I do have one opinion on contemporary love, as I prefer to call it, not modern. I think one of the things that has changed, and I'm saying this from the experience of having uh, come to the internet and to liberalization and globalization, etc. Um, slightly later, I grew up in a different culture and the cultural values that I grew up with certainly have changed now. Um, I think one of the big changes is that earlier there was this assumption and I'm not saying that there was, this was for the better. I don't think that there is any better or worse here. But there was this assumption that if you express romantic love for someone, it has to lead to a formalized relationship of some sort. I think that certainly has changed. Now, there is the assumption that it doesn't need to lead to anything, that it is in the moment, and that if the relationship is formed, it is okay for the relationship to last one night or two nights or one month, and that there will be no consequence for it, emotional or social. This is certainly new. I don't think even 10 or 15 years ago one could say that, at least in, in South Asia, that one could say that it was okay for love to lead to relationships that were so ephemeral. We understood that love itself was ephemeral, but understanding that the relationship itself could be that ephemeral is very new. Uh, I mean, an unrelated question which I would also uh, ask is love also about, in general, <clears throat> what we think we deserve or a particular sense of beauty? Because how else do you explain abusive or otherwise unhealthy or toxic relationships? Then with love? Um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> yeah, does it uh, make sense that it could be tied down to something we think we deserve or a sense of beauty and which is why people kind of continue in toxic relationships? Yes, yeah, so um, we, we've all uh, experienced uh, toxic relationships within family, not only uh, between uh, a husband and a wife, but between parents and their children, between uh, you know various uh, members of our day, experienced toxic relationships with friends. Uh, and uh, there are toxic relationships between lovers. So uh, it connects to many things. It connects to the idea that love must be unconditional, yeah, which is in itself a toxic idea. It connects to uh, self-esteem, where one feels one, uh, where one may have led oneself to believe that I don't deserve any better, or that this is my last chance. And the consequences of being single are worse socially, culturally and uh, emotionally than the violence that I am experiencing uh, in the safety of this relationship, you know, where, where just the boundaries uh, giving you some kind of social cultural safety. 
So uh, th th these are all notions that have to be examined at an individual level, at a socio-cultural level, at an academic level, you know, for, uh, e e and, and in places like these, so that uh, this uh, idea that the love is supreme and, and not me uh, can be completely decimated. Uh, again, coming back to the topic of uh, love, as we said, so if you see, you know, we were saying that there is a lot of literature about love and a lot of has written, but my feeling is that love is such a strong, such a beautiful feeling. And if you remove love from literature, so, kitna bachega literature actually. <laughs> <laughs> and if you, and if you see, uh, see, whether it, as a kuch loga ne bata hai, whether it leads to some relationship or not, ye jo khubsurat ek, ek, ek jazba hai, तो अगर आप देखें कि बहुत से शायरों ने बहुत से पोइट्स ने जो लिखा है अगर वो वो इमोशन नहीं होता तो वो कहां से वो लिरिक्स आते शक्ल पता है इन साहब को कि सामने आके पर्दा हटाते रुख से एक मेरा यही मेरा इलाज है मैं तन्हाई है कि तेरी फुरकत ने बेचैन किया है मुझको अब तो मिल जा कि मेरी जान पर बनाई है फिर मुझे भूली हुई यादों का सहारा दे दे मेरा खोया हुआ रंगीन नजारा दे दे ये ऐसे स्ट्रांग फीलिंग्स या ऐसा ओके सो द पॉइंट इज पीपल लैमेंट इन लव but that was the truth to that that's what they are anchored to live actually you know so so how can we discount you know something so intense you know as a part of human emotion actually oh fabulous and wonderful and indispensable is because it can actually be quite clear eyed about love which is why i said there are no literary greats that end as happy love stories or they end at that moment in which happiness is supposed to have been achieved because Happy love stories or fulfilled love stories are boring. And that's why you don't have great literature about that at all. And so it either ends in tragedy or either ends at that moment of whatever closure. But I, I mean, it's a good question. I actually want to go back to that idea of toxic love that you asked earlier. Because of course, toxic is a part of the word intoxicated as well. And we all like to think that we are intoxicated with love. And that's why I actually want to give you a slightly more sort of problematic maybe response to than what maybe you were expecting. I think love is toxic. Uh, but I think there are things we can do with it and hopefully many of us do and most of us do um, to make that toxicity work for us. But there are many, 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 many toxic love situations that are just toxic. It's the same way in which people talk about toxic masculinity, for instance, right? It's a phrase that doesn't make sense to me because masculinity is toxic. So, which doesn't mean all men are, but the very idea of masculinity is toxic. So, so toxicity is not so far removed, so one can't actually say, this is good love and this is toxic love. I think all love is toxic in that sense of being absolutely um, absolutely sort of uh, close to the bone, capable of hurting, uh, capable of sort of wreaking damage. But what we have to do, right, and this is, this is, uh, this is what thinkers over the centuries have, have come up with, which is that if we are left to our own devices, um, we're actually filled with hatred and filled with resentment, not with love. Love is actually much more difficult, you have to work on it. And what you have to work on is to make that hatred turn that into love. You know, which is why people say uh, it's easier to hate people you love or you have loved because you have that intensity of emotion in relation to that person. So, I mean, this is a huge topic and I've, you know, barely flitted on the surface. But I just want to sort of, again, to go back to what I was saying earlier, maybe remove that sort of touchy-feely, uh, glamorous notion of equating love with happiness and joy. I think equating love with hard work, material hard work, um, and yes, also things that can result in happiness and joy, but as a result of that hard work, is something that I'd be more comfortable with. Great. You have a question? Yeah, Dutaji, about love and premarital sex. Why do we need to connect these two? Isn't sex very different from love. They are not mutually inclusive. I would like to know your opinions. An equivalence between the two because I don't think that uh, 
love exists outside of love and actually I think it exists mainly outside of love. There are many different kinds of love and if you happen to enter a sexual relationship with someone or if you happen to marry someone, then the question of sex comes up. But um, otherwise, like I said, it's an emotion that it, it's, a, it's apples and oranges. Na? A sex act hai, wo emotion hai, act and emotion, wo kaise compare kar sakte? I mean, I don't think... I think the desire for sex leads to sex. I don't think love is. Um, first of all, I'd like to compliment everyone else. We have heard you repeatedly say uh, how we have regressed as a society with regard to uh, our sexuality and love and in general the ideas about this. Now from what we have been, from what we understand or rather what the media has given us to understand that actually we are now in living times where we have multiple sexual partners. We are having sex earlier on in life which is carrying on to later on in life. We have an entire industry which thrives on sex and love. Sex has now come out from the bedroom into our living rooms. We have a multi-billion dollar pornography industry. So if this is all to be taken under consideration, how have we regressed from our uh, Kama Sutra or Kajurao days? Or do you mean that we have just regressed legislatively and politically, not in actuality? You know, you've asked a very complicated and good question. Um, it will take me a really long time to answer it because I think each of the words you mentioned merits a discussion completely on its own. I'll start with the word you use, pornography, being an industry. I don't see how that is progress. I, I, don't, I don't call it progress. I mean to say sex is more out in the open now with regard to everything. So, so I think it is not really out in the open. What pornography does is it fulfills a demand and that demand as such, I don't know if it's gone up or gone down or whatever, I'm not qualified to comment on that. I think anything in society that has a demand finds its own. Pornography has always been around. You know, it may not have survived, it may not have been such a big industry in the past and it has certain very problematic aspects also with regard to rights etc and and uh, the question of how much of it is exploitative but forget that my question my opinion on it being regressive is partly legislative for sure i think you know when we speak of love and particularly in the context of human relationships we legislate relationships now in in very narrow ways one, this whole idea of happily ever after. Secondly, the idea that even if you marry somebody you don't necessarily love, and I think most people in India certainly, there are statistics to show this, surveys have been done, at least 75% of urban India and more than that in rural India are actually still having arranged marriages, right? So which means they're not married for love which means they are forming sexual partnerships without their necessary, not, without assuming that they want this particular partner, right? But we are also expected to enact love. I mean, if you have to love your love, you don't have to love your love, but you have to take dinner to the baby's dinner, right? So, this assumption that one must enact a love one does not feel, and that there must be love in this relationship because it is monogamous, because one cannot think of love outside of this relationship. Traditionally, up until I think maybe two or three generations before, it was absolutely accepted that you would not love your, the people you were married to. There was no talk of it. But you did still love other people, right? Now there is this narrow fusion that just this one person. You love this person, you marry this person, and if you don't love them, leave them. Now, this is a very conservative idea, actually. I, I, I just find it such a narrow idea. People marry for all kinds of reasons. People form relationships for all kinds of reasons. People stay with people for all kinds of reasons. It's very stupid to assume that there will be only just this one person in your life, firstly. Secondly, 
Um, if you read the anthology that I was talking about earlier, there is this very story, an extract from a story that I've uh, picked out. It's uh, written by Gulbul Sharma. The story is set in uh, Himachali village or Garwali, I think, uh, where polyandry was the norm. I've been to the region and even up to 10 years ago, polyandry was, you know, wahan pe draupadi pratha kehte the. Polyandry existed, but constantly through media, through reporters showing up with mics like this and saying, aap kya suna hai draupadi pratha hoti hai. People were beating reporters up by the end of it, but also shame entered the system. The system that people started to get defensive and they started to say, nahi, pehle hota tha, ab hota. So really, we, I consider that a form of regression where the majoritarian, hegemonic, cultural values are being imposed on a small community that had its own culture and where polyandry was perfectly all right. Um, and I think that more and more, the more we try to make society homogeneous, the more we try to say one law for everybody, one set of rules for everybody, only one way of being, marrying, loving is acceptable, the more we create these kind of uh, impossible situations really for ourselves. And what's happening when you talk about people having sex more and having multiple partners, they're having those multiple partners with a lot of guilt and with a lot of psychological kind of, I don't know what the correct word for it is, but certainly those multiple partners are not upheld and not respected even by the individual himself or herself while she is. That we are so liberated because we are able to give names to a lot of things. We think we're liberated because we have labels and titles and names and regimes of knowing about various things. For me, this is actually very and utterly unsexy. Uh, that the idea of desire is always about not knowing fully. The reason why desire or love or passion or any of these sort of words we associate with it has such a purchase on our imagination is because they can never be fully known. And so when I say we have regressed, I say that because we feel that because we have a label or a title for something, we know it and therefore we are progressing or we are superior to those who have come before us. And for me, that greater degree of presumed knowledge is actually a regression because what we are losing out on is that sort of uh, complexity, that sifting complexity, that light complexity of desire um, that everybody knew earlier. I mean, you know, Bean has this wonderful line in, in translation where he says, if not him, there is his brother, you know? <laughs> and this is, from, this is from 200 years ago, 150 years ago. And so there, it's not like people who came before us were repressed and closeted and couldn't do anything, but that there was an aesthetics and a sexuality of not having everything out there on display. And so when we say we can proclaim this fully and therefore we are emancipated, I don't actually see that correlation working out. How much time do we have? I think Annie and uh, Margaret said it very well. Uh, the, the correlation that just because we have words for it and just because uh, we can do it uh, means that we are in any way better than people who did it but did not proclaim it on their uh, Facebook timeline, uh, you know, uh, ma makes us modern and then traditional. That in itself is uh, an idea to be dropped. One last question, I think. Rarushi, yeah, from the anchor herself to this track. Okay. Um, it's a question to everybody on the panel, it's not a specific question, but it is a question I want to come back to. Um, there is still a lot of uh, monogamy when you call it love, and I mean particularly romantic love, uh, because it's always, what is it legit? If, if you commit to someone first, it happens to be legitimate, if you 
happen to love someone else at the same time. What I'm trying to say is the entire concept of mistresses that was there. I just if every week and all, I'm just going to go to no, I'm going to go to uh, Baji Ramasani, okay. And I'm going to go to how he was married to one and then he fell in love with another and how we're still in that phase so many years and decades later where legitimate is upheld, the second person will always be downgraded or unaccepted or why this entire system has to come into place or why is it existing still and will continue to exist is something I want to really, really ask. Almost uh, everything that's being said here, which is that love is complex and we try to constantly simplify it to suit our purposes. And, and therefore, uh, love must lead to marriage and marriage must be with one person uh, till the end of one's life. And if anything goes wrong, then there is a huge sense of loss, rejection, uh, betrayal, uh, you know, that, 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 we, that we play upon. Uh, and what we are talking about constantly is the decoupling of, of love. So, uh, and, and one of the things that Annie said was very interesting earlier, where she said that, uh, you know, when you're, when you're equating love with this one monogamous relationship, you are letting go of so many other reasons why people are in a relationship. No? And, uh, and so many other reasons why people form a family and, and continue with that family and work to keep that family together. That, so it isn't only that you had one moment of highly romantic sexualized love between two people and now it has to be uh, you know, lived through for the next 50 or 70 years. Um, and um, what this this legitimizing the first love over the others, I mean, that's a social cultural construct, right? And you know about Baji Rao because it's been made in today's time and today's Bollywood uh, values, morality has been thrust upon a story that, you know, belonged to uh, many years ago. So what, what we are doing is telling that story in today's time and uh, thrusting a morality on love, in a sense. I hope that answers your question. I, I, don't, I don't have much to add except to use the C word again, which is capitalism. <laughs> um, which is that uh, this runs across fields. Right? Not only your pehla nasha, right? your first love, it's your first born child. It's your first car, it's your first job. Everything first has a certain standing, which can only be linked to that idea of constant newness. Right? That everything, that there's a certain gloss on that first thing that cannot be replicated. Uh, which is why there's a market for vin now, for vintage cars, right? That first of its time. So it does go around in a circle, but whether it's when it was originally first, um, or vintage first, there's always a price tag attached to it. Um, which is why the, you know, which is why for instance to sort of go to parents and children for instance, that relationship between parents and the first born child, as has been documented well, is much more intense, both for better and for worse, than with the others. Which doesn't mean the love is any less or anything of the kind, it's just, it's just different. You're wiser maybe? I, I want to add one more thing. One, we are not certain Bajira married for love. Masani's father was very, very, very rich. And he gave a lot of dowry. A lot. It was enough to fund many, many wars for the Peshwa. He did not marry Masani. Yeah, but basically Masani was sent by her father. It wasn't necessarily a love marriage. It was sent with a lot of money. Secondly, with regard to matrimony, etc. I would like to just say one little thing. It is basically about money and property. If you remove from this whole equation, this whole discussion of love, marriage, property, everything, you remove one thing, children cannot inherit. You remove this one thing from a society and then you see how much marriage people want to do.
We have one last question from the festival director himself. So, Pavan Sardo, asking a question, making a comment. As a supposed, supposed festival director, I, at the festival started with my words, I thought it would be apologetically although, uh, it would be my last word and my last question, but your last word. And I wanted for you to take a deep breath, think about it and then answer it, even if you have the answer. One good thing or the best thing in men or man, male, man, <laughs> men, please. One good thing for each of you, including the moderator at the end. <laughs> or masculinity. One good thing. Starting with you, Natasha. We have to think. We have to think. As, as vulnerable as all others. I have nothing to say. much time and history and ink and wars talking about men. I don't want to talk about them anymore. They grew food. Thank you.